just as a human being, I often find when someone I know is going through something really difficult, uh, the fear of not knowing what to say when, when, they're, when they're going through it, or what can I offer in this moment? And I'm, I'm curious, you say that kind of that's one of the hardest things that you, that you do is you, is you spend time and you, you listen. And I'm just curious how you approach that when you don't have an answer or you don't know what to say to someone. Yeah, as, as I said, really, it's uh, sometimes the hard moment because um, when you don't have an answer and you have someone who is in front of you crying without someone to support her, I have experience of girls who came uh, to my hospital after all their family to be killed. So they are alone, and not alone with uh, all their capacity, but to be pregnant uh, at um, 12 or 14 years is with a big consequences on their, on their body. So when they come at the hospital, uh, it's like they already lose their um, childhood. And uh, now you have to explain to them that after to get a complication of just the childbirth, where they destroy everything, their bladder, their rectum, and their vagina, you have to explain to them that they will never get their femininity. This is something really terrible to be in front of someone who is asking you the question about some things that you can't solve. And um, most of the time when I'm facing this kind of problem, I can say that it's the time that I'm losing even my capacity to sleep. Because you, you just have impression, what can I do? But you, don't, you know that you don't, you don't have solution. You can't, you can't solve the question. And there I think that the, it's still only one thing that you can do when you are in this kind of situation, is to give love. Because everyone, everyone needs love. And I have seen how love can help girls who lose everything. They don't have family, they, they lose all, all their femininity, but when they have love, you can see that their own life can change totally. It's, it's really, for me, very important to think that everyone can give something. If just you think about the, the person who is in front of you, and maybe you can't give him material, maybe you can't treat her surgically, but you still are able to give the love. Um, throughout the whole of your career, you have you've championed um, girls women's survivors' voices. Um, and I'm curious, in terms of activism, what you think that movements like Me Too or Me Una Menos or Time's Up, or do you think that these movements are important? Do they play an important role on tackling gender-based violence, on destigmatizing sexual violence? Um, do, do they play a role? What, what do you think? Yeah. You know, uh, the rapists they are using silence as a tool. And uh, when they are raping, they are creating a situation where women can feel that it's their fault, where women can feel that 
if I talk about it, I will be humiliated again. So there is a kind of, to create a situation where women are forced to keep silence because they have to protect their family, they have to protect their children, and so on. So there is many reasons to don't talk about it. But my big question, why? Why women have to protect the honor of the family? Why women have to protect the honor of the community and don't protect their own body? It's a big question. And I think that for to use rape in any circumstances, even in the peace time, silence is a tool to help a rapist to go on doing these atrocities on women because they know that women will not be able to talk about it because they want to protect, not themselves, because when women uh, is raped, they are suffering in themselves. So not to keep silence is not to protect themselves because they are suffering inside. So it's to protect others. And this protection is not only to protect the family and the, their society, but is also to protect the perpetrators. So it's very important for me, for women, to speak out and really talk about when it's happened, to break silence is really a strong weapon against rape in any case, in peace moment or in the war moment. And for me, all this movement is really something new. And it's a hope for me that we are on a path to fight against sexual violence. Because when we'll be able to shift the, the shame from women to perpetrators, then I think that all men before to rape have to think twice. But today, it's just to create a situation where women will feel guilty, even if she is victim. And this is protecting more perpetrators than victims. So I want just to tell to women here, speak out, be strong, just break the social norms and go ahead. It's not your fault. You have to understand that you, are not, you, you, are, you don't need to feel guilty about what happened to you. Break silence. It's only the one way that I think men can take more responsibility. And for me, all this movement, I support them 100%. You're my hero. <laughs> you are my inspiration. You are my inspiration. <laughs> I'm just dreaming to see more youth in my country doing what you are doing. You are so impressive. I was going to ask you a question about commentators who say that the Me Too movement has gone too far, but I think perhaps I won't ask that question because <laughs> the answer seems obvious. Um, Eve Ensler is our, is our dear mutual friend. Uh, it was through her that we first met at the City of Joy premiere in New York. She calls you a beacon for all men to follow. And... Um, I'm curious, I think, that there are a lot of men in the world now that want to do something to help, that want to participate, uh, but sometimes that don't know what to say or, or how to do that. And I'm curious what advice you would have for men that want to be effective allies like you. When I think, when I, when I think of male feminist in my head, <laughs> 
you know, it's, it's you. And I, for men that want to show solidarity with us, uh, what advice would you give? Yeah, uh, I would ask all the women in this room to applaud the men who are here. Sexual violence is not really a feminist question. It's not a question of women. It's a human question. And I think that most of the time, you can see that, uh, if you can see in the room, we, ha we have maybe 19% of women talking about this question. And I think that women did a lot. If you can see the last century, Women fight a lot to, to get their rights. And uh, even so, there is no a single country when we can say that equality is now there. Men and women are equal. And for me, it's really very important for women to understand that fighting against sexual violence, fighting for equality, men and women, is to fight also for our own rights. And this is very important because I think that women did a lot. Now I think that it's time for women, for men to stand up. It's time for men to change the behavior and just support what women are doing. We have a lot of examples where you can see that when you support women, in the community, or the community is just moving forward and with the result. And this is not what Mkwege is saying. We have statistics on it. So why we have not to use what we know that can help our society to be better? So men, we have to stand up and support women. Good. Since the days of colonialism, the DRC has often been stereotyped and stigmatized by Europeans. Um, and I want to read a quote from The Heart of Darkness um, by Joseph Conrad. In front of the first rank, along the river, three men plastered with bright red earth from head to foot, strutted to and fro restlessly. When we came abreast again, they faced the river, stamped their feet, nodded their horned heads, swayed their scarlet bodies. They shouted periodically together strings of amazing words that resembled no sounds of human language. And the deep murmurs of the crowd interrupted suddenly were like the responses of some satanic litany. I'm curious you've borne witness to so much pain and suffering and brutality, and whether you feel the need to balance um, these stereotypical notions of the DRC with things that you love about your country, your beautiful, beautiful country, and things that you feel proud of. And how do you... The, balance that very real need to spread awareness of what's going on on the ground, but also kind of not play into these stereotypical uh, notions of, of what your, you know, your homeland is. Yeah, uh, really it's so sad, this stereotype on Congo. But uh, I would like just to say that we need really to make a difference between the people of Congo and the leaders of Congo. And it's so sad because since one century, the leaders that we got really don't care about the population. And this stereotype maybe came from, from this. 
if you, if you talk about, for example, um, the King Leopold uh, II, during the colonialism, he was really, the, the Congo was his property, and 10 million of Congolese were killed just for to get, to bloom the, the industry of car with the tire. This was terrible for Congolese people. And I think that to see the Congo, Congo and the Congolese in this group, you have to think about what happened and who is talking about the 10 million people who died at this moment, no one. After, I can say that today, we can see the kind of leaders that we have who don't care about the population. The population are starving. Children are dying with malnutrition in the country where it's raining nine months per year, where everyone can get food, but the bad governance mm. is just pushing to do really very bad things on, on the population. And for me, I think that the, the people of Congo are really a good people. And if you can see special women of Congo, they are strong. And uh, they care. But the big problem for Congo is the bad governance. And is, is now for one century of really a bad governance who is pushing that we can get this terror attack on Congo. And this is so bad. So I'm dreaming one time maybe Congo will be different. And with a good governance, I'm sure that the population of Congo can do better things. Would you, would you share something that you love about your country? Something that you love about your home? Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, I don't know if you already visit Congo, but uh, uh, crossing the Congo from east to west and um, the nature, the biodiversity is really something that I appreciate a lot in Congo. You, you, you can see that we have good lakes, we have forests, we have good rivers, you, we have many kind of animals and, and so on. So Congo is really a paradise, but the big problem is that to don't have good mm. governance mm. is just changing everything. And uh, really, if you meet with women of Congo to see how they are singing, dancing, the beautiful in many colors, I, I, I can say that really this country need really to get strong leaders who can just bring all these beautiful things to be seen in a good way and not mm. be a kind of stereotype, a stereotype of only bad things. Mm. Um, in preparing for this interview, uh, I, I didn't know this, but the DRC is one of the only places in the world that you can mine the specific mineral that we make our electronics with. Um, here in the West, and it, I wondered, I'm sure you're probably the right person to ask, what is safe to buy? What doesn't contribute to more conflict and bloodshed? Are there ways to be mindful about which electronics and which things to buy and not buy that, that doesn't contribute or make things worse? I think that the, the, the problem is not what you are buying, because I think that we have capacity really to do things better. Today the question uh, is about uh, the mobile telephone, and you can't get the telephone that you, all of us have. We can't get it without the contribution of Congo, because uh, the telephone is using tantal, mm. and this metal is really needed and it's a specific metal in the, in the mobile telephone. But I can say that the way that 
this mineral is uh, is exploited is really the bad the bad way, and uh, you know that the war of Congo is behind this war. The reason of this war, the why that uh, in this war they are using the body of women as a battlefield, is really to push the population to leave their their village uh, and and create the area where there is no law, no faith, so they can exploit mineral in the condition that they can get it cheap um, and put it on the international market very cheap. So I think what really we can think about this is how we can control that uh, we can get this mineral is in our mobile telephone, in our laptop, in all our electronic gadget without killing, raping, destroying children, using children as slaves in mines. And I think that we need really to get um, this mineral to be exploited and, and get uh, um, legally binding treaties who can really support that uh, we have to control all, all the the chain of production of these minerals. This is what we are lacking today, to get a transparency in its exploitation and the use of these minerals. Mm -hmm. And this is very sad because the world don't want really to get this chain to be controlled. Of mm -hmm. course, there is um, some good direction. We can talk about the Frank Dodd Law, who um, in the U.S., where really they can do a control, but the control is at the end of the chain, right. but not um, beginning uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the ground at where they are digging this mine. Right. And the European Union also have a law. This law will uh, be in vigor uh, on the 20, uh, 2021. But th this law also is really not enough strong mm. to push company to do right things. But what I can really ask you, all of you, you have the capacity to use your voice. You have the capacity to raise your voice against the use of children as slaves in the mine, to use rape as a weapon of war in Congo just for to get this mineral uh, cheap. There is a way to exploit it in a transparency way. And I think that if you raise your voice, I'm sure that your leaders can listen to you and make this big difference that uh, Congolese people are waiting for. We need you, and we need your voice. So as activists and consumers, we can use our voice to ask for stronger legislation, for... Sure. Yeah, around this, around this technology, which is making huge sums of money. and Exactly. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm sure that if you can use really your voice, it's, it's only the one way that I think things can happen in a good way because in all this region, we don't have companies who are exploiting, for example, Tental. We don't have companies, so right. it's more easier to use, to use children mm. uh, as slaves in mines but I think that for our conscience and ethic and moral, how can we accept that children be used in this way? How can we accept that women can be raped just and use rape as a weapon of war uh, in, in, the, in the area where this mine exists so the soldiers can exploit it and get it on the international market? I think that really your voice can make a big difference. Uh, I recently read um, this quote from you that really resonated with me. Uh, you said that taking action means saying no to indifference. If there is a war to be waged, it is the war against the indifference which is eating away at our societies. Um, I just thought that that was so well put, and I suppose echoing my last question again, specifically around the issue of sexual violence, what can we 
do in this room uh, to kind of, yeah, to combat our indifference and, and take some form of action or show some sort of form of solidarity or what would, what would you suggest? Yeah, uh, really, I think that uh, if you can see our, the history of our humanity, you can see that all the time when the humanity decide to be indifferent, the consequences were, uh, were very huge on our humanity. And uh, for me, indifference is one of the worst attitudes that the human can get. And uh, talking about indifference, I think that we have just to feel that uh, what can I do for another? How can I support another? And the answer is, for me, clear. If you want people to do something for you, you have to think that I would like to do the same for them. And this is a way to combat indifference. Because sometimes we have the impression that, okay, this can be good for, for him. This can be good for this country or these people. It's a way just to escape our responsibility as human. But I think that as human, every time when someone, some place, some people are in struggle, the big question is me as a human, sharing the same humanity as this people or this uh, place, what can I do to change their suffering? And this for me is very important in the life because when we don't think like that, we can just let things happen and at the end, we have all these terrible consequences that I, want to, I don't want to come back on it. But you know that every time, indifference is a way to destroy our common humanity. And uh, what is happening when it comes to sexual violence, especially, I think that everyone can do something to fight against sexual violence. We can't be indifferent when we know how women who went through rape are suffering. Mm -hmm. And this is not something very far. Because when we are talking about rape in conflict, for example, in Europe, people have impression that, oh, it's happening in Africa. It's something really far off us, and uh, it's, it's a culture. Even I heard people talking about culture. Mm. But this is very wrong to talk about culture, about when, when it comes to rape. Yeah. And I used just to say, uh, in Yugoslavia, it's in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Syria, in Iraq. Mm. I was in South Korea. Rape happened with the Japanese army. And when I hear women of 19, 19 years old mm. talking about what happened for them 70 years ago, mm. it was the same language as the language used by mm. girls I'm treating at Pansy 70 years after. And it's the same in Amer uh, Latin America. So I think that rape is really a question that we, could, we should not be indifferent because we are all concerned by this question. Mm. And everyone can really think what he can do to make things happen. I'm a surgeon. I'm doing what I can do. Today I'm an activist to bring more awareness on this question. And I know that yourself you are doing a lot. And I would like, really, if you can address someone to, I see in the room we have many young people. Well, how do you think that we can really help others to well, fight <laughs> against sexual violence and be really active? I would echo what you've said, which is that it's very easy to think that this is something that's just happening in a far distant, far-flung corner of the world that we will never visit or see um, in communities that we aren't part of, but like the most common UN 
statistic is that I see that this room is mostly full of young women, um, which will mean that almost a third of the people in this room will experience some form of violence, sexual or otherwise, in their lifetime. That's the whole of the section of this room. It's massive. Um, this isn't uh, an issue that will not touch us. It, it's going to at some point or another, which is awful. Um, I think there's a sort of strange acceptance as women that not feeling safe, not being completely safe in our societies and in our communities is just a fact of life and is something that we have to accept. That's the way of the world. It's dangerous to be a woman. But I don't think that we do have to accept that. And I do think that there are other ways that we could live and be. And beyond that, I think we deserve it. We have to demand it. We have to believe that it's possible. We have to believe in that world. It can't be a utopia. Um, I suppose that's what I'd say. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, by the way, Pansy, the hospital that Denny works at, is clearly does so much, um, so much more than just so much more than just a hospital. It's it's a symbol, um, truly. And uh, if you want to support Dennis's foundation and the hospital, then, then that is something that you can also do. I have some audience questions, if you'd be up for that. Um, Divyashri, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, wherever you are, um, wants to know, what lessons from history help you to understand the present day? Yeah. You know, um, I was reading what happened in 1930, around 1930. And I have an impression that when you can see the, pre the media today, you have an impression that we are not thinking a lot about what is happening around us. But you can see that head is just growing up, and you have the impression that people are talking about things regarding head as it's normal things. And people don't really, they don't feel ashamed to talk about minorities. And I'm so afraid that uh, we really don't learn a, uh, enough for what happened in the history. And you have the impression that you are in a normal time. But I think that we should be aware about what is happening now. People are talking about racism, talking about other people uh, just building war in spite to, to build bridges. And I think that this is very dangerous. And I can just make the comparison, and this is a, le a lesson for me for the, the history, that we should think a little bit more about what is happening today and be really clever that we don't repeat the same mistakes. Uh, the next two questions were questions that were asked by a number of different guests, the same questions a few times, so I will read, read those now. Um, is a full psychological recovery from rape ever possible? What techniques can help mitigate against the sense of guilt and shame that many rape victims feel? 
Yeah. I think that this question is really a crucial question because um, I don't see and think that after to be traumatized, after rape, most women who are coming at our hospital are living in with the syndrome of dissociation. So it's like their life and the spirit, their, their body and the spirit are completely dissociated. And we can do our best to try to bring this symptom, to bring the spirit in the body. But uh, my impression is that it's so hard to say that women can get a healing and forget what happened. So the life of all women that I, uh, uh, I met is the same. They can change their way of life to be more activists, to fight for the right of others. But all these things is completely different of their life before to be raped. So I can say that even if you have many techniques, in, in Congo now we are trying to use the musical therapy and see how this can support we have art therapy, we have many things that we are doing to try to see how we can support women. And we can see that women are really becoming very strong and fighting for their rights and so on. But you can see in the attitude is that when someone rapes you, deny your humanity, put you in a condition that you, you, are, you have this feeling that you are not you are not a human at all, it's very hard to become normal. You can just change your way to get a positive way to live, but you can't really say that it's already finished in my life. So I think that we have many techniques, but it can just transform maybe the pain in power, but not to change completely uh, the life when it's happening, the life of a woman. I want to ask one more question before we have to conclude, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, who, has, who has inspired you? Is there a particular mentor that you've had? Is there a particular um, inspirational figure that you've carried around with you as you've done this, this work? No, no I, I don't know. I, I have just to say my mother. <laughs> You're killing me, Danny. You're killing me. <laughs> She's my mentor. She's your mentor. Exactly. <laughs> wow. Um, I... I don't know how to thank you for giving up your limited time to be here and have this conversation with us. I don't know how to thank you for being so inspiring and <laughs> just yeah. thank you so much for being here and, and doing this with me and, and everyone who's in this room. We are, we are indebted to you. We are all inspired by you. We thank you. We, we deeply thank you. I want really to thank you for what you are doing. I know how you are committed for women around the world. And what you are doing is so inspiring. And I hope that if really you can bring more um, young women as you uh, to fight for the right of others as you are doing, I think that you can make really a big change of our world. And I hope that maybe one day you will come in Congo and just talk to women of Congo. I think that this will make a big difference for us. Thank you a lot for what you are doing. Thank you.